Well, I already need to correct something I said about the progress and plans and whatnot. Figures. Um, yesterday especially, I had been going through and restructuring projects quite a bit. Um, I believe I had mentioned, I don't remember, that I was separating out the search and metrics functionality into their own libraries. Um, that's not staying the case. Uh, it's too much of a pain for them to be separate. However, the encodings being separate is completely justified. Rune being separate is completely justified. So, trying to find a sweet spot. You don't want to extract out everything into its own shit because then you get this mess like Node.js has where you've got you know, a package for is equals and a package for is odd and other nonsense. Oh. But you don't want these huge monoliths either. And the issue with that is just, I'm one of these people. You've got people that want things to be rather modular, to use just the components that they're interested in and not use the ones that they're not. That's definitely understandable. If something's too big, it's too hard to learn, too hard to discover. Bloats your application. I don't want that. So, believe it or not, I actually look to see what the total slock, executable slock, and library size, as in like the, the size in memory when it's loaded, is. And uh, I want to make sure those are reasonable values, even according to my standards, which are very, everything needs to be modular. So, okay. That's that's part of what I was doing. The other part is the stack above core. Get off me. Um, patterns engine, which largely doesn't need to be touched. I do need to decide whether I'm going to merge tracing back into that or keep it separate. I'm not really sure. I'm not sure if it's justified a, a complex enough component to justify uh, using an interface and then having the implementation be in a separate thing I don't know if that's justified or not it might not be it might be worth it to just leave the entire thing in there I don't know but then well does the debug tools stay in their own repo? Do they get merged in as well? Because the testing tools are in, in there. Although I think this time around it won't need the auxiliary testing projects, which would be convenient. So, okay. Holy shit, they're loud. Another one? For real? It's like 8 o'clock in the morning on a dead-end road with only five houses on it. Three cars driving by the road. Trucks. Towing shit, and that is... Surprising. So anyways. Literary is... Well, okay, so there's something I noticed in patterns. I'll get to that. But literary is another one that... There's not... There's not really that much in it, function-wise. There's 
considerably more I can add to it, but even then it's not ever going to be a particularly large project unless I resort to doing like special text generators like leak te leak text and the uh, mocking SpongeBob text and uh, like a Zalgo generator and uh, things like that. But that be justified? How practical are those? Most people who are interested in that uh, don't need to do it in a high performance situation. They're just want it so that they can copy paste it onto Twitter or something to, you know. You gonna need those in some type of batch processing, high performance kind of thing? Probably not. So in that case, would I be justified in taking time to implement those? No. Probably not. So then, that means there's a rather limited amount of functionality inside of that. What has been justifying it was the fact that there is the whole um, language script and orthographies. I don't want to call it a table, but... We could just call it a database. Because it's essentially a database. There's a lot I can do with that. A lot of things, clever things that I can do to advance that. Uh, certain types that I can derive from. Uh, certain interfaces that I can implement that can greatly. Uh, greatly enhance what that system is capable of. Which would be fantastic. Even enhance it in some ways that are compatible with the base.net system. Which, again, would be fantastic. Um, there's things like equality operations that take a string comparer. If your sorting rules are defined within the language, then you have a string comparer. But there's another thing. In the last video, I was talking about how the Unicode category enumeration in .NET, it's a little limited Categorization is a bit more structured than that, and I would like to enhance it. And I had said that for at least the time being, it would be acceptable to use a flags enum setup that would cover the Unicode categories. And this is true to some extent. It does work, and if you are only interested in implementing uh, UAX 44-5.7.1, then, then it would completely cover your use case. But that's not my only use case. See, it wasn't just that I was planning around um, eventually having the system of rich characterizations, cate categorizations. It was also that I was actually utilizing some of them and increasingly utilizing them as time went on. In fact, the Patterns Engine, what it's been doing is accepting these broad categories as definitions of patterns. It should accept as well more granular categories. So, okay, if you have a flags object, then could you write a pattern node that would you know, be able to parse those categories? Yeah, absolutely. You still run into the problem of not being able to expand that at all. You know, you have 32 or at max 64 bits that you can cover. Are you going to be able to, realistically? And there's a tie-in that makes that very, very unlikely to happen at all. But if you want to 
parse a specific orthography. You've got some situation in which this particular field has to be within this language. This is actually not a contrived example. The Unicode character database itself, the names must be in English. Yeah. I'm sure you could find other examples, but yes, that is a thing. But it's also a convenient optimization and restriction at times. I'm not going to get into that because that's not the point of this video, but it, it has numerous, numerous uses. Especially since the old way I had to do it was actually through a delegate. So one of the pattern node types was uh, what I was calling a checker. It, it, there's a function that describes what to check. So it's not like parser combinators where the function describes how to parse that character or parse that whatever pattern it is. It's rather a declarative thing of this is the function to describe what the thing is to match. It does not describe how to parse it, only how to identify it. But delegates are expensive compared to just executing the function itself. It's not a huge amount of overhead, but let's face it, when there's an easy way to remove the overhead, you want to remove the overhead. So, this is a fantastic way of covering one of the common, probably the most widely used case of checkers there are. But it needs to be a granular system. So I had stated in that video that there was the possibility of using Unicode Technical Note 36, which describes such a granular system. But I hadn't gone through it all that much. In fact, that's something I had just discovered a few days ago, looking through the technical notes for any ideas. So it's there. It's old. It covers Unicode 6.1, whereas the most recent Unicode that .NET supports is like version 11. Uh, .NET 5 is supposed to cover version 12, I believe. It looks like they are based on the documents that they've been uh, using to test. Um, Unicode 13 is out now. I don't know if they're going to update for that or not. I would hope they do. But regardless, I would like whatever I do to be covering the most recent up-to-date one. You know, that's that's part of the reason why I'm increasingly removing the dependencies on .NET is because then I don't have to depend on different be out-of-date behavior um, because I am supporting going so far back, but also that... Or is it just that? No, it's essentially just that. Um, because I support so far back, uh, this time around I'm going to be actually supporting as far back as .NET Standard 1.3. Uh, I figured out how to address the concerns I had had. Um, and that was in part from implementing more and more base dependencies and utilizing my side of things um, to enable that to happen. But we want consistent behavior across all of these as well. These are really just runtimes for the... That's what I'm trying to do, to, to separate out the runtime and standard library side of things, so that I'm only using .NET as the runtime. That has other advantages as well, and porting to another architecture, uh, that, that being possible as well. But um, the less dependent on .NET I am, the better.
So, it's clear that a granular categorization scheme would be superior. You can classify far, far better. I have actual use cases for doing this. Those use cases sort of require being past an object. Now, I'm not saying object in the object-oriented sense. It doesn't need to be a fully featured class that utilizes polymorphism, although that is probably how it's going to be implemented. Um, if I didn't need this to be incredibly granular, that flag xenom would be totally fine. You pass it an object of one of the values, and boom, you've got you've got your thing taken care of. No need for a delegate, which is great. But what do I base this on? So I'm going through the Unicode stuff again, trying to find something either in the standard or something in one of the technical notes that is reasonably up to date. Oh, that was the other thing. Uh, UTN 36, I had some not simple disagreements about how certain things were being categorized. And because it's not a standard, why would I follow it exactly? So I would just go and do my own thing anyways. But I don't want to do my own thing. There's, there's a lot of freaking characters to classify. It'd be better if something was done for me, even if it was not as precise as it ideally would be. I could add in the, the stuff needed, but... UAX571 is a reasonable base. So we just need to go beyond that. There is, in the derived part of the Unicode character database, a file, I believe it's called Derived Properties. Um, but it has additional classes that you can utilize for the classification of a character. It doesn't cover all my needs, but it is a substantial improvement. Some of these are compositions of existing classes. Some of these are... Well, it uses a lot of set operations, intersections, joins, uh, unions, I guess union, join, same thing, but um, whatever the hell I call exclusions in set theory, where you've got your two sets, you exclude the ones that are common between them and take the ones that are unique to each. But there's a, there's a number of these set operations that are done, and it creates all these different categories that are definitely useful. <laughs> so, how do I go about doing this? Well, the UCD categories in UAX44571 they are already supported by .NET, but I want them in a... They're not the easiest to access. That's sort of one of the annoying things. I, I want it easy to do text processing stuff, especially the common text processing stuff. I want it to ideally be like a single function that you call and it just happens. But I want the more advanced stuff to be possible. I want it to be exposed and available. And 
.NET does this bizarre thing where I, most programming languages do this bizarre thing where they do pick this middle ground in between to where advanced stuff is hidden away typically, but sometimes exposed, but not in the ways that it should be. And there also isn't high level enough functions to allow you to just take a simple declarative approach. So you're just fucked either way. So lovely. So, write just a simple console program that lives on one of these projects. I do think this, this what I'm going to be doing is justified enough in its own project, and I'll talk about why. But have a console program in there that's sole purpose is to generate a file for one of the other projects, the actual library project that would be called Categories. <laughs> the point is to parse the Unicode data.txt, which is where UAX that um, UAX44 puts a bunch of its information, including section 571. Um, but parse that, extract out the mappings between code points and categories. Okay. You now have a fast lookup for any code point to get the category. You don't have to have each of the categories as a collection that you check all the elements through to see if it's there. Uh, you don't have to set up the categories as algorithmic collections, which are incredibly fast, by the way. Anytime you can implement an algorithmic collection, that's probably the best thing to do. But in this instance, because Unicode was not designed in a way conducive to that kind of programming, it should have been, but it's not. Um, that means we have to go with a tabular approach, which... It's fine. I'm no stranger to tabular programming or table-driven programming. It's a cap. Set up a simple table. A simple... It's a key-value database, really, so a dictionary. And I could type all those out myself, but that would be tedious as all fuck and make it hard to do updates and stuff. And Unicode goes through regular updates, so you don't want to do that. But what I can do like I described, that console program, generate the source file, an actual C-sharp file with that dictionary initialization. You now have your database. Come time for an update, take the new Unicode data file, smack it in the generator, generate the new file, compile your library. Boom. You've got an updated database. That's fantastic. Now, if this supported a more appropriate and well-designed shared object system, shared object, shared libraries, dynamic load libraries, that kind of object, then you could even do away with the pre-generator which, yes, I get is a bit of a performance thing, but um, and actually store the text file somewhere in the file system because it actually parses really, really quickly, and it would only need to be loaded once. So, parse it the first time it's loaded, and then as long as it stays resident in memory, it's just there. Um, that would enable more hot swapping of that file, which would be absolutely fantastic. Um, but most languages, because of their semantics and whatnot, don't actually allow for appropriate swapping of shared objects like they're able to support. Uh, it doesn't seem like .NET is one of those. C++ is definitely not one of those. There's something I appreciate about Ada, though. There's something really nice about Ada. Anyways. Anyways. What about this? You know, that, that covers the the UAX44. 
what covers the derived properties, these, these additional properties that I was describing. Well, this is a simple thing. Remember that whole design philosophy that I keep saying? Keep things publicly immutable, but internally mutable. The dictionary that is your database doesn't need to be publicly visible. You can expose APIs to work through it, but don't expose the database. So if you're not exposing the database, you don't need it to be I read only dictionary. It can be I dictionary. Now you have the ability to go through and modify the values. The keys don't need to change. The only thing that you would be doing is going through and seeing if there is a more specific derived property to apply to the code point. If there's not, you don't touch it. If there is, because you're utilizing polymorphism or it, any system that would allow for these to still be equivalent, but um, in my case, I am going to be doing polymorphism. There's some, believe it or not, performance advantages to this, and I'll get into how that makes any goddamn sense. But that way, if you've got a more derived classification, a more specific classification, will they still be considered as equal? Yeah, it's still derived from that base class. Of course it's still equal. So I'll get into my own extensions beyond that, because like I, I had mentioned language being, the, the language script and orthography stuff being used for classifications and, you know, there's, yeah. But first things first, get out of the way how this works. Each of the categories, objects, doesn't actually need to have anything in it. This is because of the table-driven approach. When you want to know the category of a character, because you want to know whether or not this character is within this category, you look up what category is associated with that code point, not the other way around. So categories are simple identifiers and not actually classification, uh, not actually uh, collections. It's a little different. And to be fair, I think I might have a situation in which justified to still make these categories, these, yeah, these categories as collections. Um, but the whole is this of this category system would not work with a collection type approach regardless. So you want to know if this character is within this category. It's a simple dictionary lookup, which of course are really fast. And since the only thing in the in the, the value part is the uh, category, then you just get back a simple category instance. Now you can make this incredibly more efficient by utilizing singletons so that you're sharing one, say, punctuation instance for all punctuation. That greatly reduces memory pressures. So then, get off me. Like I said, this is utilizing polymorphism. So, determining whether or not um, something is within a broader category is... I mean, I would, I would love for it to be as simple as the um, just reference equality. But in this instance, you actually have to do a tight pattern match. Uh, the performance overhead of those isn't terrible, though. 
and there might be some clever tricks I can work around to, to still do that. In fact, I could probably reutilize the um, the special I equatable and inheritance pattern that I had um, worked out to implement that kind of thing efficiently. So, I have to play around with that, but regardless, even if I have to pattern match on a type, it's not terrible performance. Especially since we don't have a nice algorithm that we can fall back on. In most cases. In some cases, there actually is, and in those cases, it may be justified to not do the dictionary lookup. Some cases where that block is actually laid out well enough to justify algorithmic collections. Not often. Actually, no, I guess I should say it is more often than not. But it's... Unicode is bizarre. <laughs> so, that gets us a lot. That gets us an exposed category lookup. Which, to be fair, it was already, but it was exposed through different APIs. You had to do it separately. Uh, go through a different API for characters than for runes, and that's obnoxious. Um, not a huge deal. There are other instances with the character properties that are that I'm not utilizing in this one that are... You can't access them at all through .NET and other things that... I'll be keeping this approach for those properties when I eventually need to implement them myself. Um, but I also get, you know, incredibly more granular categories out of this, including the ability to extend this system. And that extension is where we get into the languages. See, the language orthographies are themselves character categories. If a character is within a certain language, that's that's a useful thing to be able to test. You want to be able to test that. So, ideally, you would reuse the same category system that you already have in place. Right? Now, there are additional Unicode category the Unicode properties that I need to access for that. Um, conveniently, in the UCD, there are properties for the uppercase, lowercase, and title case mappings. And in fact, title case mapping is something that I need to provide anyways inside of Core because most programming languages, the entirety of Microsoft included, which is confusing to me because they operate in numerous countries where title casing is a thing that matters. Why it's not implemented is this I, I don't I don't know. Ignorance. You go through the exact same code path as you do well not the exact same, but the same style of code path as you do for the uppercase and lowercase. It's already in this database. You just look up a slightly different property. But two title cases not provided anywhere, and it needs to be. Sure, English speakers don't utilize it. Sure, French speakers don't utilize it. But there are languages where title casing is significant. So... That, providing those, actually allows for a tremendous opportunity for simplifying how the orthography's tables are written, but also a tremendous opportunity to extend the functionality of them. Can make it so that there isn't a separation between the uncased and cased orthographies, because it doesn't need to know 
it would have that mapping available in the form of these databases. That's, that's fantastic. You'd be able to use languages themselves as categories. Everywhere that categories winds up supporting, you can use the language. And that's fantastic. There's more I could talk about there, but the I don't want to jump the gun too much. I'd like to get into implementing this. Now, luckily, it's not too terrible to implement. In fact, the properties thing for the uh, UAX44 side of things, not the derived properties, um, that generator only wound up taking me like 20 minutes to write. So it's really not that bad. Uh, this is not that much of a divergence. And you know, each one of these things actually simplifies the rest of the code base. So that's always fantastic. In fact, that's something that's been happening a lot through this audit is simplifying the shit out of the code base. A lot of methods are actually much shorter, which is wonderful. Whether better reutilization of existing code, which, yes, that's technically tight coupling, but it's not object coupling, so it's not a bad thing. Um, but th those, those things, the whole thing is much, much more sharing, much less I actually have to maintain, much less I actually have to sort through. And this is going to continue to extend that, which is awesome. So that's it for this video. Have a good one, guys.